Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number 12 of the Homestead Journey podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, There's so many things that you could be doing right now, and the fact that you're taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey podcast is greatly appreciated. So let's jump right in this week to the Homestead Happening segment. Um, This week on 3B Farm and Homestead, it was in some regards, a slow week, and yet we also had some, well, uh, at least one big thing that happened this week, and that is that uh, we had the state vet come and draw blood from our pigs this week. Um, We're taking part in a study of pastured pig herds here in New York through Cornell University. About three or four years ago, there was uh, an outbreak of brucellosis in a number of um, swine herds throughout the state. I can't remember exactly how many they said there were. When it was all said and done, I believe they said they traced it to about 15 uh, states that were affected. And uh, they took the precautions of having the herds um, culled. And uh, I guess there was some quarantining involved. But anyhow, they're doing this uh, study throughout New York State just to see if they were successful in dealing with the problem. And so um, while we had uh, multiple conversations with the vet, had several pre-site visits with uh, the vet and the vet techs, I really wasn't sure what to expect this week. Um, Honestly, I was expecting the vet and maybe one or two techs to show up and that I would be in there helping to wrestle pigs around and instead um, I ended up with I think it was like eight to ten people that were here Uh, there were I think four vets uh, five or six techs there were people from the state uh, office of agriculture I think the USDA and they were like a well-oiled machine Um, I think they're doing around 30 herds in New York State, and I think so far they've done 20 out of the 30. So they've certainly had plenty of practice uh, in doing this, but really overall I was really impressed with how things went. Um, in particular, I was I was impressed with how they treated my animals. Um, I was impressed with the precautions they took. Some people asked me whether or not I was worried that they might... Um, you know, bring contamination to my farm, but they were very, very strict in their biosecurity practices, and uh, and so that was really good. Um, and I learned some things. Uh, in particular, I learned how to use a snare on a pig, some I'd never seen before, um, and uh, so it was really interesting to see that they kind of um, well, they they snare the the upper jaw of the pig, and then they're able to steady it. Obviously, that keeps them from being able to bite anybody while they're being pricked. Um, but uh, so I learned that, uh, and I'll probably actually invest in one just in case I need to do some kind of doctoring on a pig in the future where I need to secure it. Um, it was also cool to be able to share with them some information about the American guinea hog because it is a relatively rare breed. And so some of them, this, this was the first time that they had uh, seen that breed. And so I was able to give them some information uh, with regards to the breed, why we raise them, and so forth. Um, and many of them actually remarked on the overall disposition of the pigs. Um, the fact that they were rather forgiving, how friendly they were. Um, and so overall, it was really a, it was a pretty cool experience. And <clears throat> while I certainly wouldn't want to subject my pigs to that level of testing uh, on a regular basis, it was really good, I think, for me to make contacts with um, people both at the, you know, at the USDA and the state vet office. And, uh, and overall, I'm very, very happy that we took part in the survey. And the best news, of course, of all, um, I got the phone call on Saturday that uh, everything came back negative 
And in fact, all of the testing so far in New York State has come back negative. And so that's really great news, not just for me, but for everyone that's raising pigs on pasture here in New York State. Now, last week I did share with you that I had built some gates uh, between the pig paddocks because of the vets coming. Um, and the funny thing is, is that we used them once and that was had nothing to do with moving pigs from paddock to paddock. Rather, I did it so that the one vet tech didn't have to climb over the uh, hog panels. Everyone else was just jumping over the hog panels um, and uh, we were moving from the upper paddock down to the lower paddock. And so we went uh, went through the gate. But other than that, um, we didn't really use them for that purpose. But uh, this afternoon, I did have the opportunity to um, use them for their intended purpose, uh, moving a sow from the paddock where she was with the boar and another sow to the hoop coop that we use as a farrowing hut. Um, about three months, three weeks, and three days ago, <laughs> uh, she broke through the fence and had a an unplanned meeting, shall we say, with the boar. Um, I wasn't quite sure whether or not he had done his thing, but I was keeping an eye on her, had it marked on the calendar, and it does look like she's bagging up. Um, so I went ahead and separated her out, and um, and we'll see how things go. The good thing is, is that we are in a relatively mild patch of weather right now. Um, it's not as uh, cold as it usually is in in January. So I guess if she's going to farrow in January, this is as good of time as any. Um, we'll, we'll see how things go. So I will definitely give you an update next week as to whether or not we have little bacon bits running around on the homestead. But uh, that is uh, something that is going on here. The other thing I've been doing on the homestead um, lately is, is uh, quite a bit of reading. Um, the first part of this week, I actually finished up the book Gardening Without Work by Ruth Stout. Now, if you haven't been with us since the beginning, um, I'll kind of bring you up to speed on an experiment that I'm doing with the uh, Ruth Stout gardening method. Um, the, the Ruth Stout gardening method is a deep mulch method of gardening that primarily utilizes hay as the uh, mulching medium. And uh, so I'm doing an experiment with that. And when I prepped my beds in the fall, um, I really did this not on the basis of having read her books, but on the basis of a documentary that I had watched about her, um, some YouTube videos that I had watched, and uh, a, a lot of blogs that I had watched with regards to uh, this method. And uh, so I, I really did want to hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak, straight from the horse's mouth about this gardening method. So I bought this book, uh, Gardening Without Work. And um, <clears throat> really, I I have, uh, I've really enjoyed, I really, really enjoyed the book, um, I have to say. Um, er early on in the podcast, you, you might recall that uh, I had posted pictures of my garden bed prep to a number of homesteading forums. And the level of, um, I, I guess I would call it negativity and condescension. <laughs> well, it was rather astounding to me. Um, and the funny, one of the funny things is, as I read her book, uh, is that she was dealing with um, some of the very same things, some of the, 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 the same, you know, what the naysayers were saying to me um, is what people were saying to her as well. You know, people told me that using hay would cause weeds, it would deplete the soil, uh, deplete the soil of nitrogen, it would call in moles and slugs, and a whole host of other things. And so, as I was reading her book, it was very, very funny to me that uh, the, you know, people were saying the same things to her um, without ever having tried her gardening method. Uh, the naysayers were kind of out in force. Now, they may be right. Um, again, this is an experiment for me, um, but I, I did find that it was, I found it funny that she was dealing with the same doubters um, that I'm dealing with now almost 60, 60 years ago. Uh, this book was published originally, I believe, in 1961, so almost 60 years ago, and she was dealing with uh, the same, the same um, I guess, level of naysayers. Overall, I, I, I have to say I really enjoyed the book. From my understanding, uh, Ruth Stout was a rather quirky individual, and her writing style definitely reflects that. And I can't say that I learned a whole lot more uh, about the gardening method than what I already knew 
um, from reading the blog posts, watching the videos, and and so forth. But it really did confirm to me that I'm on the right path, and uh, so I really enjoyed it. A very very good book, and um, if you haven't, uh, you know, if you're interested in the Roost Out Guardian Method, definitely pick it up. I'd recommend it. Um, this week I also started a book called Up Tunket Road by Philip Ackerman Leist, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, or Leist. Um, I actually bought this book the weekend that my wife and I um, went up to Vermont to pick up that All-American uh, 921 pressure canner that I found on Facebook Marketplace. And while we were in, we were in Paulette, Vermont, we wandered into a used bookstore and I happened to pick up this book and one of the Foxfire books. And as we were checking out, the lady uh, mentioned to me that uh, this author was a, used to be a professor at Green Mountain College, which uh, had been located in Paulette until it closed in 2018. Um, and in subject, uh, subsequent research, I found that he actually taught classes on homesteading at Green Mountain College, and uh, he's since moved on to be this, the dean of the School of the New American Farmstead at Sterling College uh, in Vermont as well. Um, and that college actually offers adult continuing education in things like artisan bread making, charcuterie, cheese making, um, and, a, and a whole bunch of other homesteading skills, which I thought was very, very fascinating. I did not know that you could get a degree in homesteading and a degree in um, in, in farmstead uh, type stuff. And not sure how much I would want that, but I just thought it was kind of cool. Um, but anyhow, this book um, is the story of his family buying a piece of property, which I have since found out was actually located there in Paulette. And I believe they still live there and um, and kind of building their homestead on it. And I'm only a couple of chapters into the book, but the prologue of this book was amazing. And, and, and in my opinion, it was worth the, the purchase price in and of itself. Because in that prologue, he actually wrestles with what it means to be a homesteader. How do you define what a homesteader is? Um, kind of going back to episode number two where we wrestled with that. And he deals with um, some of the same misconceptions um, that we dealt with in episode number two. Um, now, please understand me. I'm not equating myself with uh, a college professor of homesteading. Um, as always, I do not claim any level of expertise. But... You know, it, it does feel good to have some of your conclusions validated by someone, um, I'm going to say, is, who's that smart? <laughs> by someone who, who you know, wrestles with these, these questions basically for a living. And uh, so anyhow, I'm, overall, I'm, I'm really enjoying this book. Uh, in part, I'm, I'm enjoying it because of the geographic references. Um, they're, they're ones that I actually know very well. And, uh, and so as I come to the end of this book, um, I will definitely give it a full review once I reach the end of it. But uh, so far, I'm really, really enjoying the book. And, uh, and who knows, um, maybe I'll, I'll be able to get in contact with him and get to meet him in person uh, someday. And, uh, you know, maybe I can do an interview of him uh, for this podcast. Who knows how, how things will go. But, and maybe none of that will ever come to fruition. Um, but the fact that he lives, you know, less than 40 minutes away from me. Um, is, is rather cool. And um, I'm just, like I said, I'm really enjoying this book, but that prologue where he's, you know, he <clears throat> wrestling with what it means to be a homesteader and some of the misconceptions, you know, uh, the misconception that uh, being a homesteader means that you have to own land in a rural setting. Um, just all of those are things that we wrestled with back in episode number two. And so really, really enjoying that book. So that's what's been happening here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Uh, what's been going on on your place? I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me by emailing me at thehomesteadjourneypodcast at gmail.com or contacting us via our Facebook uh, page. The link is in the show notes. Let's jump on over into this week's edition of Charting the Course. Now, last week we spent some time talking about the 10 mistakes you should avoid when setting your goals for your homestead. So basically the things you shouldn't do 
when setting your goals. Now this week, let's talk about some of the things you should do when you are setting your goals. Now there's a ton of different approaches, methodologies, uh, methodologies that uh, are applied when setting goals. And so if you've got a process that works for you, my opinion is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if not, then hopefully these three steps that I'm calling dream, decide, and do will be helpful to you. When setting goals for your homestead, the first step is the dream. What I mean by dreaming is to think about all of the things that you would someday like to do on your homestead and start writing those things down or somehow making a note of those things. And when you do this, I mean include everything that you can think of. I'm talking the little things, the big things, the in-between things. You know, I think sometimes we have a tendency to just look at the, I'll call them the in-between to big things when we think about the goals for the year, the goals that we're going to set for our homesteads for the year. But we sometimes, I think, look or overlook the, the little things that we might want to try on our homestead. Maybe it's a particular variety of tomato or a breed of chicken or a cattle panel hoop trellis in your garden. Whatever it is, I think including these things is important because these can be ways for us to get quick wins. They're that low-hanging fruit, so to speak, and they can keep us encouraged on our homestead journey. You may also want to include skills you want to learn, whether it's learning to can, learning how to make uh, soap, learning how to make cheese. It's important to not lose sight of learning new skills, especially when those skills are needed to handle the result of another goal. For example, maybe you're relatively new to homesteading, maybe you've only been gardening for a couple of years, and this year your goal is to expand your garden. Now like we said back in episode number six, you need to have a plan for that harvest. And so if you don't know how to can, then learning how to can and buying canning jars and a canner might also need to go on that list so that you have some way of dealing with the harvest, which is an output of your goal of expanding your garden. So you want to always make sure that you include skills on your list of potential goals for your homestead. Most importantly, don't just limit yourself to things you think you can handle this year, but include your big plans as well. For example, maybe you're brand new to homesteading. You dream one day of having milk goats, but you know this year isn't going to be the year. Now, the temptation would be to leave that off the list entirely, but don't put that on your list. As you move forward with your planning, you may be able to make strides this year that are going to set you up for success in realizing your goal next year or the year after or three years from now, but certainly include things that you know you're not going to accomplish this year, make sure you include those on your list. Another thing to consider is as you're dreaming, I think it's important to involve everyone on your homestead. Include your kids uh, in the decision-making process. Every year, my son helps me decide what breeds of chickens we're going to buy. He and I sit down, we talk through it, we, we make the, you know a strategic plan, so to speak, but I get his input every year with regards to the chickens we're going to buy. I try to involve my wife and son in deciding what vegetables we're going to plant in our garden. So I think it's important that everyone's voice is heard. Now maybe in your situation, your spouse, your, your significant other really isn't into the whole homesteading thing. Maybe by soliciting their input, uh, you can draw them into the homestead journey a little bit. So certainly make sure that this is a, um, a decision-making process, dreaming that happens not just by one individual, but by as many people on your homestead as possible. I think the 
biggest piece of advice that I can give you though about this is don't just dream once a year, but rather keep an ongoing list of ideas for your homestead all year long. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, I use Google Keep Notes. And in there, I have lists of things that I want to buy, things that I want to try, things that I'd like to make, tasks that I need to do, goals and ideas, things I'd like to investigate. As I listen to podcasts or as I watch YouTube videos or I read books and magazines, when I run across things, they go into Google Keep Notes so that I can reference them later on. Now, maybe that will work for you. Maybe you're somebody who likes to journal. So maybe keeping a list in a notebook is going to be a better fit for you. Or maybe keeping a a piece of paper tacked to the wall in your office and keeping a running list is going to work for you. But whatever it is, my recommendation is that you dream all year long, not just at one time of the year. Now, I think for most of us, the dreaming phase is relatively easy. There's so many things that we'd like to do, so many things that we would like to try, so many things that we'd like to accomplish. Uh, I think the dreaming phase is, for most of us, is probably very, very easy, especially when we cast off uh, the filtering piece of it where we say, well, I can't put that down because I am I know I'm never going to get to that this year. But when we just allow ourselves the freedom to put anything and everything down on a piece of paper, that ability to dream, I think for most of us, is relatively easy. The next part, I think, is the toughest part. And that's the decide. How in the world, once we've got all of the stuff down on paper, we've kind of got it out of our heads, and and out in the open, how do we decide out of all the dreams that we've dreamed, which ones we should set as our goals? Now, there's a goal-setting methodology called SMART goals, and the acronym uh, stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time-Bound. This is not something that is uh, um, new with me. I did not invent this. It's, It's well known uh, in business goal setting circles. Um, certainly, I think you could use that methodology as a as, as a launching point to help you decide what goals you might want to tackle this year. You may have listed some goals that weren't specific enough. So you dream of getting goats. Do you know what breed? Do you want them for milk? Do you want them for meat? Do you want them to eradicate kudzu? And and if you can't answer those things, maybe then you might want to take that goal and put it off to the side until you have time to refine that idea, uh, to refine that dream some more because it's not specific enough. Um, And so you may want to table that for later on and just focus on specific goals. Now, you may want to take some time right now to make it more specific, but definitely you want to deal with goals as you're thinking about them for this year that are very specific. As you look at your goals from a measurable perspective, you want to think about what is the criteria that will make achieving that goal a success in your eyes. Now, it could simply be a completion of the project. For us last year, I wanted to put up a Carolina carport. The Carolina carport was put up. Boom, done, success. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Um, however, it may not just be the completion of a project, though, that determines its, its success. I might want to uh, build, in fact, I do, I want to build a mobile chicken coop. Now, is the success of that project that I finished the build, or is the, the success of the project that my chickens actually use it, that I can move it around, that no predators can get in it. You know, what determines the success of that project? You want to think about that a little bit as you are working towards setting these goals and deciding what your goals are going to be for your homestead this year. Achievability uh, of the project is also key. As we set our goals, we don't want to set ourselves up for failure. And so, 
If you've never built something before, you probably don't want to start by putting on your list of goals for 2020 the building of a pole barn, unless you're going to hire somebody else to do it. But if you've never built something before, probably starting with a pole barn is a bad idea. Um, you might want to start by building some simple structures you know, simple structures, pig shelters, chicken coops, small greenhouses, um, and refine those skills, acquire those skills that you need then to later on build that pole barn. But if you've never built anything before, probably starting with a pole barn is a bad goal to set for 2020. So you want to make sure that the goals that you set are achievable. You also want to set goals that are realistic. Consider how much time how much effort, how much money it's going to take to complete the project. Now, most of us are not independently wealthy. Uh, if you are, um, kudos to you and uh, send me an email. I will send you my address and you can send me a little bit of that money my way, all right? <laughs> but most of us are not independently wealthy. So we need to be aware of how much money it's going to take to complete and maintain our various goals. And I think most of us really are, are aware of that limitation. Um, we understand that, you know, we can't spend money on everything. I think the tougher thing for us is to gauge how much time and effort it's going to take to complete a project. And my guess is, is that most of you who are listening to this are like me and you work an off-farm job. I think most people in today's day and age are not homesteading full-time. Um, and many people are involved in things outside of homesteading. Uh, besides working a full-time off-farm job, I'm, I'm the scoutmaster for my son's troop, I'm actively involved in our church, I teach Sunday school, I play on the worship team, I sing in the choir, I serve as an elder, um, I'm the treasurer for our local Cub Scout pack, my son and I play in the Washington County Concert Band, and there's probably a bunch of other things that I'm forgetting to list. And I don't say that to brag, I simply say that to say that I have to be very aware of my time and that my time that I have to devote to homesteading stuff is limited. And so that means, means that I need to be very deliberate in setting goals for our homestead this year because I need, I need to consider the time, the effort, the energy, um, and not overwhelm myself by setting goals that I'll never achieve because of a lack of resources. So setting realistic goals is key. The last letter of our SMART acronym is time bound. Now generally people uh, when they're speaking of this from a goal setting perspective um, is to think about setting a time frame for the project or a target date for completion. And you may want to do that but I also think that within home setting you should consider the time frame in which action might be needed to either work on or complete the project. For example, if your goals are to build a chicken coop, a chicken brooder, raise beds, and a greenhouse in the same year, that could be problematic. Not because you lack the skills or the financial ability to complete the project, but because the level of effort to complete all of those things is probably going to fall within the spring time frame. And so that might might overwhelm you. You may simply not have the time to do all of those things during that window. And you may need to look at that and say, well, I might want to build the raised beds and build the chicken coop, but the brooder will come up with a temporary solution and we'll build the greenhouse in the fall. Um, but you just need to think about the time frame when you're narrowing down your goals so that you don't overwhelm yourself by trying to do too much during one particular season of the year. Now, while I, I think the SMART uh, goal setting methodology can be helpful in helping us decide uh, what goals to set, it certainly doesn't accomplish everything we need to uh, help us narrow everything down um, I think there's some other things that we need to consider. Perhaps the biggest question we need to ask ourselves is on our list, is there anything that we have to do? 
it's not a question of should we do it or can we do it. It's a question of, uh, not even really a question, it's a mandate. We have to do this this year. On our homestead, there's three things that come to my mind when I think about that. The first is we have to replace our windows on our house. The window sills are starting to rot out. I'm concerned about water damage damage um, to to the to the walls, and so this year we have to replace our windows. We also have to replace our front door. It's got problems, um, and as a part of this, I want to replace our our uh, atrium or back door as well. So doing all of that is going to cost us a significant amount of money, and that is going to affect what other financial resources I have available this year to dedicate to homesteading things. The second thing that we have to do this year is I have to get stone brought in to our driveway because we've got a lot of potholes starting to get ruts and I need to deal with that and level it out. Now thankfully this year um, I have a tractor that I can use to help accomplish that task and my neighbor has some implements that he's offered to let me borrow uh, to accomplish that. So it's not going to cost me as much as it has in years past when I had to hire somebody out to do that. But whereas before I hired it out and didn't really think about it, now I need to find or make or plan for uh, the time to do it. And, uh, and so I have to take that into consideration as well. The third thing that I have to do this year is I have to replace or repair uh, the fence between my boar's pen and the girl's pen. Um, after four unplanned pregnancies, <laughs> you would think I would have learned after the first one, but uh, I'm a little thick-headed, didn't learn after the second or the third. Now the fourth one's happened, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I have to do something about this. Now, this isn't going to cost me a lot of money. Um, I think, uh, you know, five or six hog panels, and I should be good, maybe even less than that. Um, but it's going to cost, cost me some time and uh, some energy and some effort. And uh, so I have to plan accordingly. And so having those three goals already kind of set for me because I have to do them, that really helps me focus a little bit, helps me narrow things down and know how much bandwidth uh, I have to do other things. Something else you may need to do is to break your goals down into bite-sized pieces. Now, this is where, you know, we had talked about having specific goals, and you may have specific goals, but they're kind of big, and you, you know you're not going to be able to do them all this year. That's, that's what I'm talking about, those really big goals that we sometimes might have a tendency to leave off our list because I know I can't do that this year. And... So maybe, again, going back to using the example of goats, maybe your goal is one day to get milk goats. Uh, you know you're not in the position to do that this year. You might have, lack the money to get good stock. You don't have the fencing necessary. You lack a barn. You don't have a, a milking stand. Um, but if you break your goal of getting milk goats down into those bite-sized chunks, so to speak, you may be able to take a crack at one of those pieces this year. So maybe this year you can save up money to buy the goats, or you can save up half the money that you're going to need to buy the goats, and next year you can save up the other half, or maybe you can put up fencing this year, or maybe you can put up um, the barn this year, whatever it is, but by breaking it down into smaller chunks and then adding those as goals to your homestead this year, you might be able to realize that dream sooner rather than later. Uh, and again, if you were to leave that off your list altogether, um, then you might not ever get around to doing it because it's such a big thing in your mind that you say, well, I'm, I just can't ever do that within one year. So maybe by breaking it up into three or four different chunks, you'll be able to eventually get there. Something else you might want to do is to group your potential goals together. Um, you might want to group them by time frame, like spring, summer, fall, winter tasks. You might want to group them by location. You know, it's a house project, a garden project, a barn project, an indoor project, an outdoor project. Um, you might want to group them by system. 
a livestock issue, a garden project, an orchard thing, food preservation skill. But as you group them, what you may find is that you're able to narrow things down because you want to approach things from a balanced perspective. And so instead of doing everything livestock, you might want to say, well, I want to do something from the livestock bucket and something from the garden bucket and something from the orchard bucket and something from the food preservation bucket. And so, or you look at it from the time frame. I need to do a summer project, a winter project, a fall project, a spring, you know, by, by categorizing things, now you're able to kind of narrow things down. Finally, I think as you narrow down your goals, you need to keep in mind the three S's, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Not everything you're going to do on your homestead may be able to be tied directly back to those things. For example, I don't know how I would tie um, having windows replaced unless I was replacing them uh, and I could say, well, I'm self-sufficient because I replaced those windows. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pay to have a professional replace my windows, but I'm going to do that with my with my driveway. And so I could maybe say that's under the self-sufficiency bucket. But at least keep in mind, or at least give some thought as you're working towards setting goals about self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability, and then focus on the goals that are going to make the biggest impact in your journey towards those things. So dream, decide, and then do. Now I'm not gonna focus a lot of time on this point, but I do wanna emphasize the obvious. We've gotta do. Um, this weekend I was at a retreat for our church, for the elders of our church, and we were working on some planning, and our pastor was the facilitator for, for this session. And uh, he made the point that when planning, people can either make decisions in haste or they can way overanalyze and end up not doing anything, kind of that paralysis by analysis type thing. And one of the other elders said, well, we could call that paste. We're glued or stuck in our spot. So haste or paste. <laughs> Obviously, we want to be somewhere in between. We don't want to set goals too quickly. I think as homesteaders, that might be our tendency, especially new homesteaders. We jump in and we just want to do all the things all at once. We want to get chickens, goats, pigs, a family milk cow, bees, a large garden, an orchard, and the list goes on and on and on. But we also don't want to spend so much time going through all of our options as we try to narrow them down that we're stuck with either fear or that paralysis by analysis. We certainly need to put our plan in action. But having said that, we also need to be willing to change course when we need to. You know, life happens. Interests change, job changes happen, or like for us last year, an emergency bathroom remodel pops up out of nowhere. And when that happens, we need to be willing to readjust and refine our plan. So, dream decide, do. I hope you find this approach helpful and that the goals you set this year will lead to your best homesteading year yet. Well, that's all for this week's episode of The Homestead Journey. If you've enjoyed what you've heard or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the homestead journey podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.